predicted that a global pandemic would create the conditions for an intensified awareness of the structural character of racism. I can remember efforts 50 years ago to steer people away from thinking that racism is primarily a character flaw, an individual defect. And I remember the critique of the notion that the constitution is colorblind proposed by Neil Gotanda in the anthology Critical Race Theory that of course was edited by Kimberly Crenshaw, Kendall Thomas, Neil Gotanda and Gary Peller. Lawyers and legal scholars have played a major role in contesting color evasiveness. Uh, and I prefer to use this term, which has been proposed by those who are critical of the ubiquity of ableist metaphors in our language practices, by the way. But simplistic analysis of racism, sim simplistic analyses of racism inevitably lead to simplistic, ineffective solution. To assume that racism would wane if only white people would teach themselves how not to see color completely misses the point. The strategy of color evasiveness has also encouraged people not to recognize the pervasiveness of racism in our country. So in a sense, you can say that uh, 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 this color evasiveness um, is uh, designed to make people less sensitive to racism rather than to encourage them not to see race. Uh, color evasiveness uh, may have been partially supplanted by diversity and inclusion strategies. Uh, and every institution, virtually every institution in the country now has its um, uh, DNI uh, 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 section, its diversity and inclusion office. Uh, but diversity and inclusion by themselves can no more dislodge the structures of racism than color evasiveness. Both color evasiveness and diversity strategies uh, are caught up in a neoliberal ideological dilemma, which posits social and thus collective problems as fundamentally individual, as individual problems. And in this framework, the I is always the most important. The framework fails to acknowledge that as individuals, we are all products of collectivities. We are produced as individuals by communities. And we could not exist except in relation to those communities. So racism is not simply an individual problem. Efforts to challenge racism are bound to fail if they remain imprisoned within the, what you might call hyper-individualism of that characterizes this era of global capitalism. But, but finally, after the many decades that have unfolded since the end of the Civil War and the, the end of the formal dissolution of slavery, um, and after the centuries that have unfolded since the genocidal practices that accompany the establishment of settler colonialism, settler colonial states in the Americas, people are finally recognizing the drastic, they're finally recognizing that drastic measures need to be undertaken if we are ever to rescue our worlds from the grip of racism, the racism that accompanied the development of colonialism and slavery. So this is a pivotal moment in our history that demonstrates how change happens, how 
people who organize and mobilize and stand up and fight back can indeed change the course of history. 